Hello everyone and welcome to Go Worship. It's a beautiful sunny morning where I am and hopefully where you are as well. I'm excited to see what Pastor Ken has in store for us today. After Go Worship at 5 p.m. we have our Bible study. The topic we are currently learning is mental health. It's uh, if you're new to Go Groups, it's a platform where we pray and study the word of God in a more interpersonal setting. Next week at 7 p.m. we have our pain social. If you would like to know more details, follow us on social media where we will share all the details related to the upcoming event. And at the last week of the month, we have our Go dinners and the topic currently is women's ordination. And the theme for food is Irish. So if you have an Irish restaurant, please bring Irish food along with you. And we'll see you soon after Go Worship. Good morning and happy Sabbath once again. Welcome to yet another virtual Glow Worship service. We are so delighted that you are here. And if you are a woman, happy Women's History Month. We are so delighted to have you as part of our enlarged Sligo Young Adult Family. And happy Women's History Month to all the women all across the globe, whether you're joining us from Maryland, Massachusetts, or even Madagascar. We're just delighted and glad to have you here with us. Please join us this time as we sing together our songs of worship to our Almighty God.
Hello, Sligo Glow family. Today I have the privilege of bringing to you all today's scripture reading. And today's scripture reading is found in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 23. Again, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 23. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. So it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the Sabbath that you have given us. Thank you for this opportunity of life and fellowshipping with our friends and our family members. Uh, I pray that you please cover every single person that's listening to this prayer. Give them guidance, protection, and help us all to be closer to you always. Be with the participants of this service and help us all to just focus on you today. Today is your day, but also not just only today, but every single day of our lives. Thank you for everything that you've done, you're currently doing, and everything that you're about to do in our lives. And this is all I pray in your mighty name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. We're so delighted to have you here worshiping with us for Glow Worship. This week I was listening to a talk by one of my favorite musicians, John Mark McMillan. And he was discussing how, as Christians, we often see ourselves as David, but never Goliath. As the Israelites, but never the Philistines. And the point, of course, that he was making was that we always identify ourselves with the heroes, with the righteous, but never with the enemy, never with the unrighteous. And I was thinking further about that. and. Even in identifying with the heroes, in doing that, we often gloss over the fact that they do not always act in heroic ways. That the righteous do not always act righteous. For instance, we may see ourselves as the Abraham who receives and is waiting on a promise, but not the Abraham who takes matters into his own hands. We may see ourselves as Jacob who is tricked by Laban, but not as the Jacob who tricks Esau. We may see ourselves as the David who is able to conquer his enemies, but not as the David who cannot seem to conquer himself. This, of course, only proves that there is no one righteous, not even one. A sentiment that is first expressed by David in Psalm 14 and then later in Psalm 53, and also echoed, echoed by Paul in Romans chapter 3. For another example, in Proverbs, in just four of the Proverbs that Solomon writes, he uses the word fool over 70 times as he compares the wise and the foolish. But when we look at Solomon's life, we know that he did not always live in wise ways. And in fact, he was oftentimes the foolish one. But many times, of course, it is easy to ignore our own foolishness when we look at the foolishness of others. It's in confronting our imperfection, though, that we realize that we're united by our imperfection, that we are united by need. In recognizing our need, we are able to empathize, and it's in our empathy that we are able to grow in our relationship with God and with others. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you just so much for who you are. We thank you for your word, and we ask that your spirit would open our hearts to your word and you would plant it in the good soil of our hearts. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. In John 4, with the woman at the well, we see that there's really two sides of this coin. On one side, there's those who shame others, and in doing so, make themselves unapproachable. And on the other side, we see that there are also those who feel such shame that they feel unable to approach others. So you have those who are unapproachable, 
and those who feel they are unworthy to approach. Let's read John chapter 4, and I'll show you what I mean. Looking at verses 3 through 30. It says this, Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come to this well anymore. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, come here. The woman said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying you have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem it is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I am he who is speaking to you. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, Who do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Though the story is about the woman at the well, I want to especially look at the disciples first who, though only mentioned briefly, reveal a lot about the human condition. Notice that when it says that they arrive on the scene, that they marveled that Jesus is talking to a woman. Now, this is not because they are like Rajesh Kuthrapali in Big Bang Theory and unable to talk to women. It's because women in Jesus' day were not allowed to leave home without the permission of their father or husband. They were not allowed to appear publicly unless they were heavily veiled. They were not allowed to talk to strangers, and they were not to be taught. In fact, there was a rabbi in Jesus' day that said it is better to burn the Torah than to entrust it to a woman. Yet here is Jesus speaking publicly with a woman and talking theology with her, no less. And at the end of this story, though this woman and any woman could not give testimony in court, it is this woman's testimony that brings the entire town out to meet Jesus. Notice also that John mentions that none of the disciples asked, what do you want? Or why are you here? Why are you talking with her? Given the circumstances, I think we can assume it's not because they didn't want to ask these questions, Rather, I believe that John is revealing what was on his heart and the hearts of his fellow disciples. Though they were not outwardly shaming her, inwardly they were thinking, what is she doing here? 
why is Jesus talking to her of all people? And this isn't the only time that we see the disciples shaming people this way. In Matthew 19, there's this story of one day when children were being brought to Jesus and the disciples try to shoo them away. But instead, Jesus uses this as an opportunity and says, bring the children to me. And then even uses them as an example of the type of people that will enter the kingdom of heaven. Elsewhere, we see the woman with the alabaster jar of perfumes and oils who is shamed for her use of the money by one of the disciples. And yet Jesus declares that her act would be remembered forever. And here we are 2,000 years later still talking about it. The disciples, who were mostly made up of fishermen and tax collectors, were themselves outsiders. And yet, here they are as outsiders, looking down on this woman as an outsider. Whether we are inside or outside the margins, most if not all of us have treated others as outsiders at some point. And you would think that those who are outside or who have been on the outside would have some compassion. But many times as a way of either deflecting the blows from inside or trying to move into the inner circle, those on the outside treat others outside the margins the same way that they themselves have been treated. You know, even myself, as someone who spent my middle and high school years often feeling like one on the outside, there was a point throughout my middle school and early part of my high school where I really wanted to be part of that in crowd. And I regret that at times, though I had been on the receiving end of bullying, I acted as a bully or stood idly by in hopes that the attention would be drawn away from myself. The disciples of Jesus were themselves misfits, and yet here they are treating the woman at the well as a misfit, a woman who already felt like a misfit in society. After all, she isn't coming to the well at the hottest part of the day because she enjoys the heat, but rather the heat of the sun is preferable to the heat that she receives when she goes there at the normal time to draw water from the other women in town. When we think about it in the great controversy, humanity is on the outside. We are on the outside of heaven. But rather than leave us here, God became one of us in order to bring us in. Just as Jesus goes out of his way to meet this Samaritan woman, who is not only scorned because she is female, but also by the Jews because she is a Samaritan, yet it is to this Samaritan woman, to this outsider, that Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah. This woman who was on the outside has now been brought in. And though the disciples were already inside, Though they were the closest to Jesus, they just didn't get it. But if we're shocked by the disciples and how they treated this woman, we may want to take a look in the mirror. Sometimes we who have been brought in from the outside treat those who have been brought in as though they are still outsiders. Or we treat those who are outside as if they are unworthy of coming in, as if we were somehow worthy when we received the invitation. Romans 3.10 says that there is no one righteous, not even one. And verse 23 of that same chapter tells us that all of us have sinned and all of us fall short of the glory of God. In fact, that word sin, hamartia in Greek, means to miss the mark. We have all missed the mark. There is not a single one of us who is a follower of Jesus because we deserve to be. Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 says, It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one may boast. We don't get to be a part of the in crowd with God because of anything that we've done. 
We are a part of God's in crown because of what he has done. Our relationship then with each other inside this in crowd must be that of agape love as we spend time with the one who is agape. Putting others before ourselves so that the world may witness what the love of God is, that they may witness and experience that love of God. And then it doesn't stop there. The same way that Jesus went out to bring us in, he also calls us to go out in order to bring others in. The church was never meant to be a country club. Membership in the body of Christ is free. And there are not different levels of that membership. It has all been paid for, and the same price was paid for all, not by gold or silver, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As 1 John 2, 2 says, Jesus not only paid for our sins, not only the sins of Christians and those who have chosen to follow him, but the sins of the entire world. Ironically, it's the same sin that divides us, that really puts us all on the same playing field so that none of us is in a better position than another person. It is our pride and our shame that comes from comparing ourselves to others that gives the illusion that we are better or worse off spiritually. A gossip may be better than a murderer from our standpoint. After all, most of us would rather be talked about than killed. But both sins separate us from God, and because God is life, Both sins effectively lead to death. It doesn't matter if I've forgotten to charge my phone or I've chosen to take a chance on the battery lasting. Either way, it's going to die if I don't reconnect it. God wants to empower us to live new lives. And we can choose to plug in. We can choose to see how long the battery will last. Or we can just give no thought to it at all. But there is no one who does not sin. We just all sin differently. What's tempting for me may not be tempting for you, and vice versa. But at the end of the day, every sin is the exaltation of self, and a self-centered person would not enjoy an other-centered world. Except, of course, for the part where they then become the other centered experience of other people. (laughs) Sin and every evil act committed by humans is ultimately rooted in selfishness. And it's for this reason that Jesus says we must die to sin daily, that we must die to self daily, that we must pick up our cross and follow him. This is the key to overcoming. It is not our work but our surrender that makes us better people. Flesh cannot overcome flesh. Flesh can only be overcome by the Spirit. After comparing the work of the flesh with the, with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, Paul goes on to say that if we live by the Spirit, we must keep in step with the Spirit. So dying to self is not just about emptying. It is also about filling. For in addition to dying to self daily, Jesus says that we must abide in him, that we must live with him. In the Christian walk, it is not enough to receive the living water and the light of the world occasionally. We must abide in him daily in order to grow and bear fruit. A branch doesn't need the vine occasionally. It must be connected to that vine every day in order to bear fruit, in order to continue to live. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And he says, apart from him, we can do nothing. We must daily set aside self, surrender ourselves to the vine, and he will produce fruit in us. And if you think about it, fruit doesn't push its way out of the vine. It doesn't sit there and grunt and push and try and make itself an apple. It just simply grows 
from the branch. It just simply is connected and it comes out as a natural part of that process. And it's for this reason that no one can boast. A follower of Jesus is not one who has worked, bought, or fought their way into the in crowd. A follower of Jesus is one who has surrendered. A follower of Jesus is one who hears and accepts the invitation to come in. That's it. And in leaving the old life behind, we then receive the Spirit. And it's that same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead that's empowering us to live new lives in Christ. All of us are in need of Christ. And we are united in this need because all of us fall short. But the good news is that he is willing and wanting to give us the living water. All you and I have to do is ask. And if you have not asked for or received that living water, I want to invite you now to ask Jesus for that living water, for that water that will quench your thirst forever, for that water that will satisfy you spiritually and lead you to this place where you are content no matter what happens to us physically. Or if you've already accepted that, then I want to invite and encourage you to make sure that you always live a life that is other-centered, that always seeks to be in one accord with those around you, as well as those who are outside so that, so that we may witness and bring in. This is what Christ calls us to. He calls us to come in so that we would go out and bring others in. None of us is better than another. None of us are too good. But rather, Philippians says that we should regard each other as being better than ourselves, having the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the very nature God, did not use his equality, his power as God for himself, but instead was obedient even to the point of death. Jesus used all of the privilege and power he had for others. So let us use all the privilege and power that we have for others as well. Father God, we thank you just so much that you love us and you want to be with us. You want to be with us in a personal relationship. You want us to be part of your in crowd and not just us, but the entire world. God, I just pray that you would keep us humble, that you would help us to never see ourselves as better than another, that it is only your righteousness that makes us righteousness. The only work that we have to do is surrender. Help us in that to surrender. Help us to set aside ourselves daily, to spend time with you daily, that we may die to self and live for other and be filled and led by your Holy Spirit. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to encourage you that if you are able, if you have the means, we still have ministries here going on in the young adult department. We have outreach. We're partnering. We're restarting our refugee program. We've been even giving you know care packages and things within our own Sligo community. We are staying actively engaged, and this, of course, requires some resources. And so I just ask that if you were able, that you would allow the Spirit to lead in terms of what you can do to give and be a part of this GLOW community. And if that doesn't look like money, maybe it looks like time. There are so many different volunteer opportunities, so many different ways that you can be a part of our GLOW ministry here. And if that is something that you're interested, I encourage you to reach out to me, reach out to any one of our young adult leaders so that we can get you connected and 
have you a part of the ministry and things that are going on here. Thank you again for joining us and just pray that you have a wonderful week. God bless.
Hello again. It was truly a blessing witnessing the worship service today. I will be joining you guys today at 5 p.m. for Bible study. And don't forget our Glow Worship on the first week of every month, as well as Glow Study at 10 a.m. every Sabbath and our Pain Social next week at 7 p.m. More details are going to be shared on our social media site and uh, on the last week of the month, we are going to be having glow dinners. So please bring your Irish food as we study the topic of women's ordination together. It still seems sunny, as you can see, it's shining through my window. I'm going to go on a walk. I will see you in the evening. Happy Sabbath.